I suppose, I mean, I'll do my best. I mean, I, a lot of the stuff that I like to focus on is, is taking very fundamental ideas, very simple, uh, I suppose, yeah, musical concepts and then making them work for me. And I don't like to confuse things. I like to keep things as simple as possible so that I can streamline the way in which I'm thinking. I don't think, I don't want to, you know, trip myself up with anything. And so regardless of how things appear on the page, um, I look for a way of just, of, I suppose, taking it apart and, and figuring it out and having a, a, at first having a fundamental understanding of what that is and then finding a, a methodical way of practicing it so that I can embed it on, into my muscle memory on the saxophone and then play it without having to think about it. Um, and so I know that um, we've got a drummer, Jonathan. So I'll, a lot of what I, I, I promise I'll do my best to, to really um, have some things to offer you. <laughs> it's all right, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but there are some general things that I think could be of use to you guys. And I, I suppose I'm still going to talk a lot about music and improvising, but then there could be some more general approaches and, and how to practice things effectively. And, and I, I'll do my best for that to be catered to all instrumentalists, not just, you know, single line instruments or harmonic instruments. Um, but the way that I practice, um, and also I just mentioned Harris, you're going to, you've heard a lot of this already. So me and Harris have done like a lot of one-to-one -one lessons together on Zoom and stuff. And so I'll try and make it new for you as well, Harris. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> um, so the way in which I practice is by, through to well, through solo transcription. I'll find something that I'm particularly uh, moved by at first. Anything that I listen to musically, it has to be moving. And I, th I think my general sort of ethos with music is that I, I want to be moved before I'm impressed. And so I'm, you know, I, I love people. It, it is impressive when you see people who are particularly technically gifted on, on an instrument. So listening to people like Michael Brecker on the saxophone is just, it's stunning. You, you can't help but really appreciate what he can do on the saxophone. It's, it's mind bending. It's unbelievable. And the same with people like Charlie Parker and John Coltrane. It's, it's as if they're, they're, it's beyond a musical pursuit. It's, it's something else. They're kind of reaching for something else. It's, it's, you, you can't really put it into words. Um, but still day to day, I, I, I would rather listen to maybe someone play two or three notes and for them to be perfectly placed and to have immaculate tone and, you know, execute it with amazing technique and have great, you know, just really good taste and serve the music well. Um, and so that's certainly, that's the kind of, that type of thing is, is what I would have to offer for musicians, not just saxophonists. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I transcribe other people's solos. That's how I practice. And once I, once I'm more familiar with it, I, I learn it by ear. And then uh, once I, you know, I'll, I'll pick a certain melody that, that I find particularly interesting, then I hone in on it and I, and I study it on a fundamental level. And I look at the way in which it outlines the harmony. So that could be one fundamental. I'll figure out a way of playing it effectively on the saxophone. So that would be addressing my technique. I'll maybe try and match, maybe not always, but at least acknowledge the tone of the musician and see if I can draw an influence from that or see if it's, you know, maybe recognize if it's darker than how I sound on the saxophone or if it's brighter or, you know, um, I'll use that melody to work on my time and feel. And so certainly for, for you, Jonathan, time is a completely integral, I mean, it's integral to all of us, but you're a drummer, you're, we kind of lean on you to, to, you know, to keep really solid time and you're going to influence the placement of our notes. And, you know, that's really important. Um, uh, time and feel of harmony, um, then the relationship between the notes, each note in the melody and harmony. And once I have that intervallic structure, it gives me an understanding of what's going on, musically speaking. And it's that understanding paired with muscle memory, which can really liberate how I, how I improvise, not just improvise, but how I play music. 
Um, because I don't, like I said, I don't want to be thinking too much when I'm playing. I don't want to complicate things. I want things to be simple. The last thing that I want to do when I'm playing on stage is to be playing music by numbers or thinking too much about the harmony. I want to know about the harmony and to have an understanding of it and have a means of communicating those ideas in a rehearsal or in a session or you know, on the fly on stage if you, if you have to. But when it comes to being creative, all of this needs to be under your fingers and just kind of everything needs to be automated in your head so you have to look at things in a very fundamental methodical way so i i thought perhaps today for you guys since that you're kind of the top dogs in your ensemb in ensembles we could maybe talk about a very structured way of um playing out and adding color and playing out doesn't just have to be a bunch of nonsense you're not you're not just plucking anything out of thin air you're you can still have a very structured method to playing out. Um, and a way in which I like to do that is with triads. Really simple. Just, I mean, obviously you know what a triad is, and, but they're so effective at accessing some of the, the more extended harmony within chord types. Um, by having the triads within a mode and, and all of their inversions under your fingers to call upon within your muscle memory is a very effective way of, um, again, adding a bit of color and injecting this sort of, um, uh, like a, a, how do I describe it? It's just harmonic color into your playing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna quickly, um, I'm gonna screen share, um, Let's see if I can figure out how to do it. Oh, there we go. Oh, you're going to have to enable me to do that. Um, stupid. Okay. Should be good now. Hey. So, not to be too much of a, this isn't a sales pitch, but this is my book <laughs> that I uh, brought out recently. You all have and to buy it's it. It's basically a, yeah, that's part of the deal. <laughs> um, and it's essentially, it's just to quickly talk about it, and it, this isn't my main focus for being here, I promise, but it's, it's basically a very a comprehensive introduction to jazz improvisation. And it starts with very, very, very simple things like the major scale and how it's structured. And, and I, I, don't, I certainly don't need to talk to you guys about that, but it just offers a very analytical breakdown of ideas that you can apply. And, and so um, maybe just to, we'll get to this little, this section here of the book um, momentarily. <clears throat> um, but I just want to play, I just want to show you some triad pair ideas. And just like a show of hands, have, have you guys maybe worked on triad pairs before? And or have you heard of the term hexatonics and that type of thing? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, and so perhaps I don't need to demonstrate this, but let's just say if you look at the what's in front of you now, figure 35 and 36, and then the breakdown of the inversions, you know, just at a, at a glance and at face value, does that kind of make sense to you? Um, the idea of building a triad from the root and also from the seventh degree and alternating between the two and that kind of giving you this sort of rich palette of harmonic color, that type of thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I, I think so from what I can, because I can't see all of you at the same time, but uh, yeah, I think that, that looks about right. <laughs> I think you're, you're all on board. Um, and so you can apply that to any chord type, any mode, any scale type, it doesn't matter what it is, but what I like about thinking, or, or what I like about using triads is that it, it prevents me from thinking about scales too much. I don't like thinking in scales because it, 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 then things become too like notey and perhaps that's like a, a silly way of putting it, but I, it's, I would rather think harmonically and I'd, I'd rather look at a chord symbol and just think of, and, and for maybe three or four notes to come to mind or two notes to come to mind rather than the scale that that chord is associated to. <clears throat> and so the same can be applied with you know, trying to play out and adding a bit of color to your ideas. Um, and so if we just go back to the ideas I had in front of me a moment ago, 
Um, here I'm using, I suppose in both I, in both examples, I'm, I'm still using a triad pair. <coughs> um, but one of them isn't diatonic to the chord we're playing over. So if you look at figure 52, um, the, the, the notes that I highlighted blue are just the, the D minor triad. So obviously that's just the triad rooted from, uh, stemming from the root of the chord. Um, but then we have an A flat minor triad um, in the mix there, which is which stems from the tritone of the root. And so um, this is like a very effective way of adding quite a jarring kind of sound. And, and it can sound a bit out there. Um, but within this context, because there's a, a strong sense of resolve and this, you know, you know, like the term voice leading, the way in which you navigate through chords and in, an, in the midst of a line, you might have moments of resolution where you move by a semitone, you land on a chord tone. You know, I, I, I try to apply effective voice leading when I'm using these triads because it, it, it makes things seem a bit more seamless, I suppose. It feels more natural for the A flat minor triad to be there because you have this G note, which, you know, semitone away from the A flat. Then here we go back to an A natural, which is the fifth of the, the D minor chord. Anyway, if I just, I'll quickly play it to you now and then by all means play it to yourself as well at home, but I'll play it to you just so you can hear it. Um, just to check, could you hear that okay as well? In terms of, yeah. Um, and so at the end there as well, I've, I've intentionally made the resolve of, of the line very minor pentatonic and blues based it you know it kind of it grounds the phrase a bit more and that's not perhaps you know you don't always need to do that that's just how i like to do things because I, I predominantly play in like a pop context <clears throat> and to be honest if i played that line on stage with the night 75 i can't imagine i'd have a gig for very long because it's not very appropriate but it's a very um in this case it's a very you know, it's, it's a, I don't know, an open plan context. It doesn't matter what, what the line is, but, um, and there's some chromatic movement within there as well. And I suppose here it's an example of, you know, I'm not really thinking of a specific scale type that these notes come from. So I'm thinking about this section here where I've, I've got this little bracket here, chromatic movement, and I've got an E flat and a C sharp. And so at base, at face value, the E flat and C sharp have nothing to do with D minor seven. Um, there may be other examples on different minor chords or <coughs> examples within functional harmony. So, you know, if that minor seven was a chord three, you would quite often see a flat nine on that, you know. So maybe you could say it's derivative from that if you really wanted to. But I just, for me, if I'm looking at a D minor seven, I don't really have time to think about the scale that it comes from. Again, I would rather look at it at face value and think, right. All I'm doing is momentarily playing a flat nine and then I'm momentarily playing a major seventh here on a D minor and it just doesn't matter because it sounds quite nice. You know what I mean? So if I just play that, that little part of the phrase and think of it as a little lick. You know, I don't care where it's from because I think it sounds good and that's, that's kind of the end of it. And, and, and I do offer an, an analysis, obviously, because it's a book, so of course I have to, but it, in the real world, once I have that understanding, I cast aside all analysis and I, and I don't wanna think about too much about it being a flat nine or a major seventh. Initially I do so that I can understand it, but once it's into my muscle memory, I sort of have this conceptual idea of what that phrase is. You know, I can hear it in my head. So I like to use I, I like to use the term inner ear, my inner ear. And so my that's essentially my expectation of what I want to play. And um, and you can that can be applied to anything. It, it doesn't really you could be playing over a blues. You could be playing <clears throat> in like a punk rock band. You could be playing like John Coltrane arrangements or whatever it is. Um, once you have that fundamental understanding and that's paired with your muscle memory, you, you, you don't really have to think of anything. And so these um, examples, they, they give you an analysis of what they are and it gives you a breakdown of, 
of how to use these triads and how to play out effectively. But once you have that understanding, at least for me, this is just my opinion, I would rather just have a more liberal school of thought and not think about it too much. Um, and and, and the, the following example, in, if you look at figure 53, um, and by all means, whilst I'm talking, that you, you can have a play, you can play through this and, and see how it feels under your fingers. But this is an example of sidestepping. And, and perhaps the, the, the actual definition of sidestepping, maybe it varies depending on where you hear it. But in, 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 my, in my mind, it's, it's where you momentarily step out of the key you're playing in, or you step away from the chord that you're playing over, often uh, by a semitone. So in this case, we're playing over D minor seven again, and we're going to use an E flat minor, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, well, arpeggio, but I'd really the triad um, uh, to just momentarily step out of key. So that sounds like this. <laughs> So again, at the very end, I'm using this sort of Dorian language and, it, and it's not particularly pentatonic either. It's quite Dorian-esque because I've, if you look at the notes that are within that and then perhaps think about G major um, as like, a, like a, an imaginary key center, we've got this sort of sus sound over a G chord. So the C and B are like the, the sus four and the major third and then G, D and then C again. It's, it's it's, it's a nice way of imposing this sort of G major sound over a, a minor seven chord, a D minor seven. And <clears throat> again, if you wanted to think about it triadically, these three notes here are just our G major triad, but in second inversion. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but we're kind of going to focus on this bit for the time being, the E flat. And it's there's nothing complicated about it. It's not supposed to be complicated. And I'm, and I'm not trying to blow your minds in any way. It's just a very simple way of of momentarily playing out. And it's, it's a very, also it's a very simple concept for you guys to explore as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so any idea that you have, let's say you've got some sort of stock blues licks, for example, and um, the kind of stuff that you, you constantly go back to, or maybe you've got a two, five, one line that you've played a thousand times. You can see how it sounds. Um, uh, you can see how it sounds by integrating some uh, sidestepping ideas. And so let, let's like maybe say over the dominance, you could, you know, two five, two five to C, the dominant would be a, a G7. You can be as freeing as you like and say, right, well, I'm just gonna see how it sounds if I play an A flat seven there or momentarily step out of key and see how that affects my voice leading. You think about the notes that are closely related, closely related between like an A flat seven and a C major seven, for example. Um, so maybe the fifth of A flat is an E flat. So therefore you're a semitone away from the third of the, the one C major. You know, to be honest, I, I've never played that before. So I don't even know how it sounds, but it's just, I would pluck something like that out of thin air and explore it. Um, and and really it's, it's as, I, I wouldn't want it to be any more complicated. You can just, once you have this base uh, kind of level of an idea, just using your intuition and the, the stuff that you've already played before, I, I imagine there'll be, maybe you've transcribed ideas from records and you'll have stuff under your hands already, which it might be close related to some of this stuff. So maybe you've already played it. And then by going back over it and having triads in mind, perhaps you'll discover that you are playing some of those triads, but in, their second or, um, sorry, first or second inversion. <clears throat> um, but again, it's, I would now, I'm sure you have perhaps explored some of the things to this before, but maybe if this isn't reinvigorated, maybe listen back to some of the transcriptions you've done and see if you can discover or find any uses of this, particularly in more groove-based music or modal music, because it's in that kind of a setting where you'd have one chord to play over for, you know, just an, an open end solo, just a repeated section over, let's say a D minor seven, kind of like Kind of Blue or uh, Maiden, the Maiden Voyage album by 
Herbie Hancock has a lot of these uh, really open solo sections where you just play over one chord. So you have to have a means of really exploring the sound of that mode. And again, I would I don't want to think about scales because then my I, my solos are just going to sound they're just going to sound scalar. You know. <laughs> It just doesn't sound particularly, you know, inspiring. Whereas if you use triads to explore that, you can have a more structured approach to playing with color. Um, You know, there's still a lot, there's a bit of blues in there. I was predominantly trying to stay within the uh, Dorian mode, but there was, you know, little elements of chromaticism where if I had to, you know, if I had to really think about it, I can pick out what I'm playing, you know, but I'm, I'm just thinking very openly. And um, the next thing that I'm gonna go into does offer more of like a, a very precise way of adding chromaticism. Um, but generally speaking, I would rather just um, kind of abandon all school, uh, rational school of thought and just pay, play kind of what I like. Um, and so <clears throat> have you guys heard of enclosures? Does that ring a bell? Um, and so- They've done lots on enclosures. I think with-, with okay, great. <laughs> and so- <clears throat> I don't know, let me just find a good example of, or a good starting place. Um, so I'm assuming I don't have to explain what they are, but perhaps I can give advice on, on how to practice them. Um, and I think anytime that you discover a new method, or let's say you stumble across something really cool in the solo that you've transcribed, or your teacher gives you something new to work on, um, it's good to practice it in a context which is already familiar to you. So maybe that could be playing it over um, a standard that you're familiar with or playing over like, let's say a two, five, one. Um, and so, so we'll delve into that in a moment though. Um, given the nature of, um, of enclosures and, that, and the, the chromatic movement and, you know, perhaps on certain instruments, you kind of have to I don't know, um, it, perhaps it pushes your, your technique to play them effectively. I've, I've got a couple of exercises in this book that can just help you to work on them. And so here we take a, a pretty standard enclosure idea and then I just move it around the cycle of fourths. And in fact, the cycle of fourths is a very, very good context to work on stuff. Um, and, and so again, my apologies to anyone who doesn't play um, uh, a melodic or harmonic instrument. Um, this may not be particularly inspiring at all, but I, I feel like I have to uh, continue because I've started. <laughs> um, and so the, 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 the cycle of fourths just offers a very methodical way of working on something because it, it almost gives a realistic musical setting to work within, you know, because um, if you consider the, the bass movement of the cycle of fourths, it's, it's the same as like a, a turnaround, like a three, six, two, five or a two, five, one. Um, and so anytime you have like a new melodic cell, it can sound good to work that around the cycle, which I've done here in uh, figure 62. Um, and then I'll, I'll keep it there because I can just see a couple of you guys are playing through it. So I don't want to interrupt you. Um, and you'll find that even with this, um, if we just look at the first bar, you know, if you really want to, we can think of that in a harmonic way. So we're starting on the flat seven, then we go up to the major seventh, 
we have the nine, flat nine, then we resolve to the root. And so it is good to acknowledge that at first. So if you're playing a tempo which is absolutely burning, you know, then you don't really have the time to think of each note. It's, it's the analogy that I use all the time, and sorry, Harris, you've heard me talk about this all the time, but if I'm talking, you know, I'm not thinking about each letter of each word. I have an idea that I'm trying to communicate and then I just make my point. And it's the same with this type of language where you're, it, you have to commit it to muscle memory and you, and you regard it as shape and color. You have this sort of chromatic sound that you're trying to convey. Um, and so these enclosures are a very effective way of doing that without having to think too much. Um, and so just below that, the next exercise is this sort of, um, it, it moves up the, the whole tone scale. Um, and so you can still think of it as the enclosure here resolves on the first note of each four note grouping of, of eighth notes. So I mean, I'll, I'll play it to you instead of, instead of singing it. And so it's not, it's not the most inspiring thing you'll ever hear, but you, the idea is just, again, to develop the muscle memory to then apply it in a more musical setting. Um, and then here in the book, there's just another example of a different, a slight variation um, on an enclosure. And so here is where I'm, I'm gonna use it in more of a creative setting, musical setting. Um, and as you can see, it's just over two, five, one this first one. And so all I'm doing is um, over this two five in the key of C, I'm playing an enclosure to then resolve onto the, the fifth degree of, of my D minus seven, um, which sounds like this. You know, I'm kind of taking a very conventional piece of language with this two five one. And it, it's as simple as just putting an enclosure at the beginning because it just adds a little bit of, I don't know, flair, a little bit of interesting movement and, a, and a, uh, this momentary dissonance with the chromaticism, but then again, a very strong sense of voice leading because I'm moving from the A flat to the A natural here. Um, and I suppose similar to the triads, it's, it's not as if you're just gonna, you know, if, if the only thing you played was, you know, were triad pairs over and over and over again, your, your ideas would just sound triadic and it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't really be language. You know, it would be like using the same, I don't know, this, maybe this is a poor analogy, using the same five words over and over again and trying to communicate something new every time it would be almost impossible. Um, and so by using the enclosure in and amongst other language, it gives, it gives context for the idea. Um, and, and again, we're, we're kind of talking about um, there's a little bit of chromaticism later on in the in the phrase as well with this little approach note, um, you know. And for the sake of analysis, it, it's the major seventh. But after a while, if, if you're used to playing that two five line where you use the, the flat nine and then the major seventh in passing, that just becomes an idea in your head. You, you don't have to think about it. You're, you're just playing color and shape, and the same can be applied to the enclosure. And again, it, in figure 65, I'm, I'm kind of doing a similar thing, but with more of like a blues inspired sense of resolve. Um, slightly different enclosure shape here, but I'm just using the enclosure to, to as like a creative way and a chromatic way to, to land on the root note of my C minor seven. And then I just play a very blues inspired resolve. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, and so these little, um, I suppose these chromatic little passages are a great way of, um, along with, you know, chromatic passing notes and approach notes and maybe some triadic ideas, it's a great way of adding interest to groove based solo sections, you know, where you're limited to one chord, it gives you the means to, to really explore um, a, a particular chord type or a mode. And, and venture out um, of the diatonic harmony, but in a way which is really structured. You're not just playing a bunch of nonsense. You know what I mean? There's a, it's a very streamlined way of thinking. Um, 
Actually, I'll play this this last figure because I, I can remember it. I quite, I quite like this one. Um, and so it, this is maybe a good example of combining enclosures with triad pairs and a little bit of chromaticism and, and still and the whole the whole thing is still in keeping with blues. In my opinion, as much as, especially when you look at it on the page, it looks as if it's quite a departure from the blue scale. Um, but if you were to play this in and amongst some other blues language, you can kind of get away with it because there's a strong sense of resolve within the line. There's, you know, the use of the enclosure here, it doesn't sound too jarring because I resolve onto the flat seventh on this note here. I start on the fifth degree of the, of the dominant. Uh, there's a little bit of chromaticism here, but I resolved nicely onto the flat seven. And then given the, the nature of I'm just playing, you know, between a minor third and a, and a major third on this dominant chord, there's nothing too crazy going on there. It's quite blues influenced. I'll just play it to you now. And so, you know, if I, I'll try and demonstrate now where I'll play, I'll just improvise over G7 and then I'll play that line. And hopefully it won't sound as if I've ventured too far from the core sound of that dominant seven. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, hopefully that was kind of apparent. It was predominantly blues esque and sort of. R and B, you know, like um, Junior Walker, that kind of sound. But then, you know, this kind of approach—it's it's a very soft way of using some chromaticism where it isn't too jarring. You know, it, it's not too out there, and it's a—it's a very um, appropriate way of just adding some color to what you're playing. Um, so I'm just checking my my notes. <laughs> um, and so I, I suppose <clears throat> perhaps I can kind of round things off now and summarize because I kind of want to reiterate the point that I made at the beginning of the session where I, I don't like to complicate things. And, um, and I think as well, just because something's simple, musically speaking, it doesn't mean that it's redundant, you know what I mean? And then it kind of goes the other way as well, just because things are particularly challenging to play or you have to kind of think a little bit more to understand what's going on it doesn't mean that it's going to be more useful to you as a musician or more creative i would much this is maybe down to my taste i would rather listen to a musician play two or three notes and for them to be perfectly placed and have this amazing rich tone and you know and for it to completely convey the sound of the music and the emotion in the music i think that's far more important to me and so I, I, the things that I look for in music are the things that move me rather than impress me. And I don't know if you guys are the same, but that's just my opinion. And so in terms of practicing, um, if there happens to be something which appears to be very complicated, I, I try to use very basic fundamentals to understand what it is in the first place. Um, and so I suppose, you know, um, with regards to, you know, drumming, um, I'm just trying to find. Is it is it Jonathan? Is that your name? Yeah. Yes. It, yeah. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> I, I feel like I should speak to you mo just for a moment because <laughs> it's only fair. Bless you. <laughs> You've been sitting through the 45 minutes of me talking about chromaticism, and but it's. I understand it's, it all. Don't I? <laughs> amazing, and I think I suppose for you as as a rhythm section player. Um, and regardless of the role that you have in a band, I think you can, you know, listen for ideas, sorry, listen for moments of intensity within someone else's playing. So say that you're comping, you know, you can, I suppose you can, it's not that chromaticism is always gonna be the intense part of a solo or just because they're playing out, it doesn't mean that you then have to play more, 
but you can, that's naturally going to inspire the way in which you play, I suppose. It's going to have an influence on the ideas that you're going to generate within your comping and within your accompaniment. And I imagine there's perhaps the, a parallel for you as a drummer would be um, um, things like, I don't know too much about them, but like metric modulations, I think, is that the term? And, and like imposing different time fields and that, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's, you want to use those sparingly and perhaps there's moments where, you know, where it isn't appropriate to play those type of things, just in the same way where it's not appropriate for me to play moments of chromaticism or deliberately playing out if I'm playing over a pop song, you know what I mean? And so I think the point I'm making, which can be certainly directed to all of you is that, you know, the context that you're playing in is it's, it's kind of crucial to, to, to really acknowledge um, um, or just to acknowledge that and to, and to know how to play appropriately. And so just because you can do these things or just because you know about them, it doesn't mean that you should shoehorn them in every single solo, you know, you know what I mean? And so I, I, you know, just to reiterate, I think less is more always until there's a moment where there's the intensity and the backing to play more. Um, so perhaps, I don't know if perhaps that's a good way to, to resolve things, but um, uh, sorry to, to summarize, but um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Has anybody got any questions for John? John's just going to jump in here as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me grab some cans. So, um, it's, it's a nice one, guys. I'm thinking about, um, John's obviously talked to you a little bit about the chromaticism and the triads. I'm thinking that um, Harry does some stack triads and things down at Birmingham with uh, Mike. John, what sort of patterns would you practice at the beginning to sort of like get used to playing triads? Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. I actually intentionally breezed over that because I thought you guys were far too hip for for that. But I've got a, yeah, a ton. So if I let me. Um, so basically, I'd love you to show them one or two things from whatever yeah. you would use for like that. And then these guys can have a quick practice. I mean, you don't have to be there for that bit by any means, but that'd be really nice. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. So um, I would pick a simple chord type. Um, like a dominant. And so I've got a few, quite a few exercises here. Um, this one's nice because it, because <clears throat> they're grouped into triplets. And so each triad is self-contained within its own grouping. And so all, all I've done here is, if I just go into sorry, the previous page, where I explain it, where I've built a triad from the root of the mixolydian and then also the um, flat seventh of the mixolydian. And so that gives you a G major triad, which is highlighted in blue, and then an F major triad, which is highlighted in orange. Um, and so by playing through, if, if you play that pattern that's in front of you, you inherently play through all of the inversions of each triad, um, which the reason behind that is that you can then call upon them in that within that inversion, let's say if you're improvising, you have the muscle memory there to, to just to call upon immediately to then play through it. And so I'll just quickly play through maybe these three or four exercises that are on the page, just so you can hear the sound of them. <laughs> So in this, you know, in this context, they're particularly sequential and pattern-like. Um, but then the, the, the <clears throat> examples that I demonstrated earlier kind of show these triad pairings in a more musical, creative context. And so what I would then do is once I've explored this in over a dominant chord and in different keys, so that the different keys that are demonstrated on the following pages. And so and they just go around the cycle of fourths, just for the sake of having a methodical way of moving through different keys. Um, I would do this for each exercise through every key, which that inherently gives you access to all of these 
um, just different shapes under your hands. And, I, and then it's something I've talked about a fair amount this evening is interpreting music in, in more of like a shape kind of form and not thinking in numbers too much because it, it's, it quickens the way in which you're thinking. Um, but then I would then apply the same practice and the same method to a different chord type. And so here I do that over a minor seven. Um, and in this case, we have the root of the Dorian, which is a, in this case, D, that gives us a D minor triad. And then I build a triad from the root. So that's C, E, G. Um, so that, that gives me major triad. So it's like a blend of minor and major um, tonality. Um, but while still self-contained within that one mode. And so here at figure uh, 44, I outline the different inversions of the triads that that gives you. Um, and then the, the exercises here are the same kind of permutations as the, as the ones over the, do, the dominant chord, but over a D minus seven. And so um, I won't play all of them just for the sake of time, but I'll just play, um, I'll play the top one just so you can hear it. Um, and, and it, yeah, so there's not, at face value, they're not the most inspiring exercises, but the, again, the shapes that you can gain under your hands are great because you, you can then access so much color. You, you essentially have a very streamlined way to access the higher extensions within a chord um, because that you're just thinking and try. It's a very fundamental, structured, little musical um, nugget. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, John, that's cool, man. Um, we'll do some work on that in a bit when uh, when you've disappeared. The anything from the guys? I mean, like, do you want to ask him anything about what it's like going on tour with the 1975, or how did he get into that, or what was Leeds College of Music like compared to what everybody else talks about? Because obviously, John's you know, big on Birmingham, and but you know, that, have you got anything that you want to ask him while he's here, just to finish off? Um, I'd say like before you went into music college and stuff. Mm -hmm. Who, who was your main inspiration at that point in time? Good time. If you can um, remember that. Yeah, no. I, I was listening to a lot of funk and soul music. So bands like Tower of Power and saxophone players like Lenny Pickett and Tom Pollitzer. Um, basically, the lead, basically the, the lead tenor sax players in Tower of Power were my heroes at the time. Um, there was also a guy, a guy called Jeff Watkins, who was a saxophone player for James Brown. Um, he's on a lot of the, the, the later videos and performances that James Brown did. Um, there's actually a really good, uh, I think it was like a DVD. It's on YouTube, Live at the House of Blues in Las Vegas. And the sax player on that is Jeff Watkins. And he, he's great. He's got this monstrous tone. And so I suppose guys who predominantly had like a brighter sound. Um, I, I listened to other jazz music. I, was, I, I loved Joshua Redman. And Michael Brecker, obviously, they, they've always been massive influences. So I think the, the, the players that had a more direct influence on me were the kind of funk and soul musicians, I suppose. Cool. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Um, when you were at music college, what would you sort of do to try and prepare for leaving and actually going into the industry? Well, the good thing about being at a college is that it, just by being there, you have your network of musicians. You know what I mean? And so let's say if you didn't go to music college, you, you would still have your network because you've been playing in ensembles and you have people to call upon, you know, and the UK is small enough to be able to travel around different cities to work if you need to. And, you know, and so it's, um, it's still possible, but the, the, the advantage that you'll have by going to a music college is that when you all graduate, you're all in it together. And so you tend to, whilst you're there over the course of, for me, it was three years. I, I kind of, I found my inner circle of friends and, and people who I liked playing music with. And, um, uh, and so when I left college, I was involved with maybe five or six different projects playing different styles of music. Um, and then, which inherently became me, I was playing in different places. So Manchester and London and then the Northeast. And, and so I was just by being around the people that I was studying with, I was, busy you know I, I wasn't always earning a lot of money but i was busy and that was the main thing i was if, if i wasn't gigging i would be rehearsing and writing and recording different styles of music with different people and 
that had a very good um, effect on my trajectory into my into the early years of my career. Um, and so I, you know, I think by the time that you graduate as well, you you won't be nervous about it. I think you'll be, you know, you'll be quite inspired because you'll by then you'll really have a kind of a, a, your own sound and creative identity and your own direction. And so you'll be keen to explore that outside of the context of the music college. Um, and so Very I suppose just to, I just, yeah. I think that's uh, a good question that, um, John asked, and actually, can I just be a bit of a devil's advocate here? Because obviously I think that um, what John said is perfect. It's about a busy musician at college will be a busy musician when they leave. Now, what interestingly, John, um, the thing that I would like to know is when I was at college and everybody else I know, there was always people who were on the same college course that everybody knew were never going to really make a career in music. You know, and it was like it wasn't it wasn't being mean or being nasty or anything like that. And it's not anything necessarily mm -hmm. to do with their playing. But like, I'm sure it was the same for you. You just there were great guys and they were like, they're never going to like make a living out of doing playing or they're never going to make, you know, mm -hmm. there was all those. Is there like a particular thing that you think you could put your finger on about why those guys were not going to be doing it and why you ended up doing it? Um. I, well, that's the thing. I don't really know because for me, I just always knew that I would, and I was quite. There was just no question about it, and and that, and that wasn't because I was particularly better than anyone else. I just, I just always knew, and regardless of how well music college was going to go, I was still going to do my utmost to become a professional musician. I think perhaps, <clears throat> um. And also something which was always to me advantage was to, to, sorry always to my advantage was that um, I had a really in, encouraging people around me like my family have always been really encouraging my family friends and my peers at school you know I, I, I was always receiving um, just a lot of encouragement and um, so I, I, I don't really know May, maybe. I think if, if, if you go to a music college because, uh, I don't know, because I don't want to be mean by <laughs> saying this, but be, but but you be perhaps. If you go to music college thinking that it's going to be music college that makes you a musician, that's not the way. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the way John said it. You know, the busy people, busy people going into college and the busy people going out of college. So if you go to college and all you do is the college end of term recitals, never going to be working in the industry when you go. I think that's you know what I would have said, John. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think so. And I think maybe some people really like the idea of being a musician, but don't realize that it's it's a lot of work. It really is. And I think as well, you I suppose to put you in good stead and to have a strong mindset and to develop a strong sense of resilience and patience, you have to allow quite a lot of time to go by before you know before you feel really really comfortable. And I think for me, I was, I was happy to be, you know, to live a very simple, <laughs> sounds silly, but a very, very, very simple life for quite a while before I was earning a, a, a better living. And I, I was, I would have happily invested 10 years of my life to make that a reality. And I was fortunate that in my early twenties, I got a good break and a good opportunity. And, you know, and that's, I'm very fortunate and very lucky to have that. But I would have happily, I'd still be there now because I just love music too much. I, I, there's nothing else that I want to do. So maybe that's a defining quality is that there was simply never any doubt in my mind that I wasn't going to be a musician. And it had nothing to do with how gifted I was. I just, I wanted it really bad. Nice, John. Really cool. Anybody else for the last couple? Last thing. Uh, yeah. So did you have any like idea of what you wanted to do after you finished music college? Or like what kind of stuff you want to do in music college or did you just kind of go and see yeah no no i i think um i, I suppose because of the influences i had when i was a teenager I, I think i always wanted to be in more of like a pop world really pop and rock music and i've always been more in tune with the culture of that as well i you know i've, I've always listened to probably more pop music than jazz music like I love amazing songs and I, I like lyrics and, um, you know, the meaning behind things. And I feel like sometimes that gets a little bit lost with other types of music. Um, 
And so the, I suppose the kind of reputation that I had whilst I was at music college was the guy who could play in that pop setting and not worry about sounding cheesy. Because on a sax, as, as a saxophone player, the second you play things in a certain vein, people are going to be, people, it makes people cringe. But I just didn't care because I enjoyed doing it. And also I could kind of, um, I, I would rather please the masses, I suppose. I, I liked playing in more of like a rock venue and in that kind of atmosphere. And, you know, that, that oh, and the, the social kind of world within all of that was just more, it was my kind of thing. And it's not that I don't like jazz gigs. I love, you know, playing in a more intimate jazz setting, but it's just something, something to do with the, the kind of atmosphere in the room and that type of thing. It's never made me feel particularly good when I'm on stage. Um, and so I think because people already started calling me for the more pop orientated gigs, I just naturally fell into that line of work after college as well. And I was already playing in kind of, I used to play in a hip hop band and um, a couple of different funk and soul things. And so I was regularly seen doing that type of thing before I graduated. And so that just snowballed and, and grew and um, which was fine by me because I, I loved doing it. And so that naturally led into the more kind of pop session world, I suppose. Um, and I think, John, I, I get a, a, a little great bit. sense of fulfillment from that. Yes. Yeah, I think, Ollie, I think, you know, John went and did a jazz degree, but he didn't have any vision of being a jazz musician at the end of it. You know, he, he kind of, mm -hmm. there's no preconceived, I don't know, because you're thinking about it at the moment, thinking, you know, where do I want to be? What do I end up wanting? You know, but I mean, like, it pretty much changes. And as long as you want to uh, have music as part of your life, you'll find that, you know, you're, if you're an open guy, the pathways come to you, you know, and that you'll naturally start falling into those places where you feel the best fit. And so and I think that's why um, going to a college that's suitable for you is sometimes better than going to the college, which seems like the best college. So I know people who go to Cambridge because they want the best law degree. But it's definitely not the, you know, that might be in the first step and then that blocks the next bit. So, you know, I, I know loads of pro players who've gone to Surrey and done things with Peter Gabriel. I know Pete, loads of pro players that have gone a different route to get there. It's about, you know, being busy, working, playing and meeting as many people as you can, having open ears, open hearts and finding out what turns you on, really. Uh, I hope that's all right, John. I didn't mean to jump in there, but... Um, no, no, absolutely. Because um, a couple of, I was really lucky that the, the course that I did at Leeds, it was predominantly a jazz degree, but I, in my second year, I, second and third year, I could take on other modules that had nothing to do with jazz music. I did an Indian improvisation module, which was amazing. I did a music for film module in my final year. One of the, I did two minors and a major. My major was jazz performance. And my, one of my minors was jazz composition and the other was music for film. So I spent quite a lot of time in my final year at college doing something that had nothing to do with playing the saxophone. And what was interesting is that it, I found it really inspiring. I, I absolutely, I really fell in love with fil film scores then. And for the first couple of years, basically leading up to touring with the 1975, a, a big chunk of uh, my earnings came from writing jingles you know, for small theater productions and short films. And, and that was a, a skill set that I acquired in my third year, and I, I certainly didn't go to music college thinking that in the final year I would take on that module, but I, I did, and um, I, I was massively inspired by it. And I think had I not got the tour with the 1975, I would have spent more time writing music for TV and, and, and other kind of visually based things, probably more than I was playing the saxophone. It kind of got to that level where I discovered this new thing, fell in love with it, invest a lot of my time into exploring it further and it became almost on par with my flagship goal of being a, a good saxophone player um and so yeah i suppose to reiterate my point when if you if you are to go to music college just soak up as much as you can because you, you, you don't know how things will play out and, and it could really be to your benefit yeah guys that's really cool we'll call that it for john's session thanks very much john um i'm sure if we've got any other little questions you won't mind um responding to them 
Um, but also I'll drop them a message about the book and all that sort of stuff. So thanks very much. I look forward to booking you again. Guys, I'm going to end the meeting there, then I can save the video, and then I'll restart it again in one minute. So if you need to nip to the loo and get a can of Coke or something, um, go and do it now. But just come off mic and say thanks to John, and um, I'll catch you in two. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.